Today, we bring you Carol Mahoney, founder and chief sales coach at Unbound Growth. Carol has been called the sales therapist by a Harvard Business School professor, where she coaches entrepreneurial MBA students on sales. She has been featured as a top 15 sales influencer by LinkedIn, a woman to watch in sales by Sales Hacker, and a top sales coach by Ambition. Here is Carol. Carol, welcome to Extraordinary Outcomes and the special segment of fixing the five percent conversion problem in B2B sales. I'm delighted to Thank have you. you here. Thank you so much for having me, Savanjan. I um I, I'm this is an interesting topic. I had to take a few moments to think about uh sort of the direction here and I think it's a it's a it's an important thing to discuss. Right. So please tell us about uh, yourself and your work and and well you know your work is directly linked to our discussion actually. So to think of so I mean couldn't have a better person to talk to uh, about this. So please tell us about your work and and about yeah. yourself. Uh, well, so, you know, if we take a step all the way back to where I started, I got my degree in marketing. I ran a marketing agency and my focus then was even then on conversion. How do we get more people to raise their hands? Because it's so expensive to try to you know, dump leads into a funnel that has all kinds of holes in it and is leaking. Like it's the, I, I used to use the metaphor of, you know, imagine poor Jack and Joe when they went up to Hill to fetch a pail of water and the, hall, the pail was full of holes. How many times did they have to go back and forth? It's tiring, it's expensive. So in marketing, I was always focused on the conversion rate. I was also focused on making it buyer first because in the age of the internet, we no longer have control over the process. The people have the power of the information. And so it's no surprise that the internet has changed the way that we buy and sell. And then what was happening in my marketing agency is that as I was making and the marketing world was making the transition to online and buyer focused and, you know, developing real, you know, buyer journey paths, sales was still using the same sort of tactics that they used in the 80s and the early 90s. You know, ABC still meant always be closing. And I was finding the clients that I was working with, no matter how many leads we would deliver, would hardly get any sales from it, which is exactly what we're talking about today. And that's when I realized that if my mission was to help small businesses and startups to grow and scale and create jobs, because this was back in our last major economic recession, then I have to look at what's happening in sales. And long story short, I had to make my own transformation in how I thought about sales before I could help anybody else do that for themselves. So now what I'm focused on is how do we hire the right people for the right roles so that they are able to succeed in the particular environment of the company, in their market, with their buyer and against their competition. And, uh, and alongside that, be able to convert more of the leads that are coming in or attract more of the leads coming in that turn into sales so that businesses can grow and create jobs and make the world a better place. So I went from looking at marketing conversion rate to sales conversion rate, and that really came down to what happens on the front line between the conversation between buyer and seller, between seller and manager, and then all the way up the hierarchy and chain. So this topic, why is there only 5% of B2B sale leads converting? I mean, it's an organizational issue as well as an individual contributor issue. So I'm excited for us to dive in. What do you attribute the problem to? How did we land ourselves here? Uh, if there were only, if only it were one simple answer that would magically unlock all of the mysteries that why this is happening. But it's it's multi multiple reasons that sort of feed off of each other. I think that first and foremost is you know. We attract leads that maybe aren't the most qualified leads in the sense that these are not our ideal buyers. And so if we look at how we're attracting people in the first place, both in marketing and in sales hiring, who are we attracting? Are we doing the right kind of matchmaking here? That's essentially how I look at marketing is that our job is to attract the attention and the interest and maybe spark a little bit of desire to want some kind of a solution or problem to solve. And I think if you look at also the studies from Serious Decisions and Gartner and Forrester that say that buyers are such a percentage all the way through their process because they need someone to help educate them and inform them of their options because the internet is overwhelming. Um, and so I think that the first problem is, is that when we can't buy into the idea that buyers don't want to talk to sellers because there is research that also says that they do want to engage with them, but they want to engage with them in a way that is collaborative, that makes them think differently about their problems, makes their options clear, helps them to lay out the consequences of each option. The, the job of a seller today is as a consultant. 
Um, and so I think they need to actually be involved in the leads much earlier than a t quote unquote sales qualified lead, because a lot has happened before that point that they have had no influence or collaboration with. So I think that's the first problem. And there's a, a sales and marketing alignment play here. Uh, there is a, a, a a problem with we talk about buyer personas and profiles, but we, we create them, we put them in a PowerPoint, we stick them in a file somewhere, and then they never get looked at again. They should be a constant living iteration in your business because guess what? Everything changes all the time. I think that's the biggest problem is there. I think that the other big problem that we have is who and how we're hiring salespeople. Because again, if we're trying to match our ideal buyer with our ideal seller, it's not good enough to go off of subjective opinions. It's not good enough to, well, this is what we did at a previous company, or this is what our competitors are doing. We're going to hire the top salesperson from the, top, the biggest company in our space. Just because it worked there or worked before doesn't mean it's going to work now with your buyer in your market against your competition. It is a match, like a snowflake. It's going to be unique. So I think there's that problem as well. And then there's how do we actually onboard our salespeople? Is it, all right, here is, here's how to get to email and how to get to Zoom and here's your Skype account. Um, and then product, you know, followed by deep dive into the CRM and sales process, followed by here's our product, deep dive into that. And then the buyer is, you know, somewhere week five or six. And then we're surprised when our sellers get on the phone and product pitch, talk too much, talk all about themselves in the company and don't ask enough questions, don't collaborate with their buyers, don't understand their world before they ever stop talk talking about their solution. I think that's the problem as well. And then we can start getting into what's happening in the conversation with the seller and the manager and the mindsets and beliefs that get in the way of how they sell because it's not what you sell or the process that you use, or sometimes even the methodology you use, but it's in how you execute it that we're seeing that lower conversion rate. And most of those problems start in the discovery. They start the moment a salesperson says, hello, I'm so-and-so to a prospect. Okay, rant over. <laughs> ah, no, no, this is these are all very, very important points because although you might have sort of summed it, uh, summed it up in like three minutes, the, the fact is that each of these are impacting businesses. And I so much agree with you. I, I believe that sales is the engine of the economy. If we can't solve it, that's why countries are poor or countries are abysmal because they yeah. have not mastered the art of selling what they have in, 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 by understanding the buyer. Right. So you have mm -hmm. touched upon practically what you're talking and I'm saying deja vu because these are exactly things that I think about and I believe. Right. So let, let, let me just step back and let's pick up one of the things that you said. Everybody says that the salesperson has to be a consultant. He, he can't be a sales guy anymore. Exactly. He has to be a consultant. But where it ends is becoming an expert of the product. He is not expert of the customer's problem. And that's where the consultancy right. is in conflict, right? So it's like going to a doctor who knows the medicines but can't figure out what's wrong with you. So no matter how many medicines he knows about, it's of no value to anybody because there's nothing to exchange, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, one of the guests we are talking about that, you know, 20 years back, if you had to do research on a, on a customer, you had to go to the public library. You had to possibly write to them, get hold of their annual report, which will be mailed to you and come to you after 10 or 15 days and so mm -hmm. on. Today, you can literally look up someone in minutes, but we refuse to do that. We refuse to ask the questions you said, right? We, we are not asking yeah. questions. We are not listening. Yeah. I mean, so what's really wrong? Is it, is it the people who are coming to the profession? So that's connected to who are, who are we hiring? Or is it really a problem with the leadership? So there is, there is, it is a problem both with leadership and with the salesperson that we're hiring and that we're not doing in this discovery question. But to use your metaphor of the doctor, who you can go to the doctor and say, hey, doc, I have all of these issues and symptoms and problems. If he doesn't know the medicines that will solve the problem, that's an issue. But I think that the bigger issue is that if you go to the doctor they ask you a couple of surface level questions to understand which medicine should I subscribe without ever digging deep enough to understand why you're even having the issue to begin with. Because a medicine, a pill, 
a, a technology solution, a service, is not is is a band aid if it doesn't address the root cause of the problem that the buyer has. And that's where we see churn happen. That's where we see product pitches happening too early. That's where we see buying on price rather than on value. That's where those issues start to arise. And those issues arise because of leadership, because of the way that they hire, because of the way that they train their managers to manage and coach and train their sellers. And then it filters on down the hill to the buyer and the impact the seller can have on their world. And I think that the 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 mindset that happens, I mean, let's think about this for a moment. We both agree that sales is the lifeblood of any business. It is the lifeblood of our economy. It is also the second most distrusted profession in the world. And that is something that seeps into organizations, both at the leadership level, right at the very top, the founders of these companies, the presidents and the CEOs, and their mindset towards sales it then creates a culture and environment that breeds beliefs and mindsets that don't allow these things to happen. And you can see that, for example, for managers who are being pulled in every direction except coaching their salespeople and training their sales speech, of which I don't care what study or research you find will show you that that is the most likely predictable way to increase performance. But that's the last thing that managers do. Like 7% of managers worldwide are strong sales coaches. That's dismal. So there's issue number one or 12, however you want to look at it. But then you also have to think about what are the beliefs that the sellers have when they're trying to execute? Like, why aren't they asking? What is stopping them from asking those deeper questions? And that often comes from a belief or a mindset or the pressures that are being placed on them to make a call number, to make a meeting number, to make a you know deal opportunity creation number without looking at the quality of what's actually going on. So we dump more effort, we dump more leads in a funnel and it all comes leaking out through marketing, through sales, through all of these different places. So I think the question we have to ask is where's the biggest hole that we need to plug our finger into to stop the biggest bleeding? Um, and depending on your company, it could be the, your hiring process. I know a lot of companies are starting to hire right now and I'm having conversations with them where they've have a success rate of one in five, two in five of their salespeople that are succeeding, that they hire them and two weeks later realize that they're not going to get on the phones. They're not going to follow up. They're not going to ask these questions and and dig deeper into buyer problems, no matter how much we train, because they're not coachable or it's a square peg in a round hole. I think that's that's where the biggest problem starts, which then you'll start to unravel some other things that happen. So, uh, you know, it's a multi-pronged thing, but I think one of the hidden things that we don't talk about enough is how our beliefs and mindset towards sales in the sales profession, not out, not even just outside of sales, like salespeople don't even trust other salespeople if you want to read the studies on that. We have to address that, I think, in the, in the culture that that breeds before we can expect to see any major change in the numbers that we've been seeing for the last five years. You know, we spent $70 billion in sales training in 2017, according to Harvard Business Review, and 54% of sellers still a year later and a year later and a year later for five or six years running now are barely making 50% of quota. So it's despite technology, despite enablement, something's not being addressed here. And that's what I see as the biggest hidden hindrance to making this change. Very interesting points, because uh, what you're touching upon is trust like belief, trust. Yeah. We believe that's a cornerstone of any transaction. We cannot trust ourselves, yet we expect the buyer to trust us, right? Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's a strange phenomena. Yeah, well, and here's the other thing that's a strange phenomena is, is there's, there's being trustworthy. You know, if someone should be able to trust you, but then there's being seen as trustworthy. How are we communicating? How are we communicating our trustworthiness? And it happens in a lot of ways, both in the words we say, both in the actions that we take, uh, the follow up that we do. How credible are we? Do we know the things that we say that we know? Do we do the things that we say we will do? You know, if you say to a prospect, I'm going to do this, and then you don't do it, that erodes that credibility. If you're talking all about yourself, that erodes credibility. If you are using words that they don't understand or talking about things that aren't important to them, that reduces credibility and trust. You know how many people actually feel nothing that tracking prospects or customers with the material they send them, the collaterals and the mails, without permission tracking without permission is fine it's fine 
when you are telling your your SDR that I have this technology and I and I and I'm calling out all the all the sales tech companies there and I, I'm doing that for some time. Uh, you need to make up your mind about trust. You really need to make up your mind and 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 tell where you stand because. Mm-hmm. Everybody understands. Would you really like somebody to know? Just, I mean, I didn't ask you to send me any collateral. I didn't ask for your mail. I have not solicited anything from you. Mm-hmm. You found intent data somewhere. Somebody sold you my intent without my knowledge. And you have now taken that, send me some stuff. And without my knowledge, you want to track what I'm doing with it because you want to call me when I'm stuck on your pricing page to say, hey, Shubhanjan, why are you not buying? Is there something I can help you with pricing? I mean, you know, there's something fundamentally, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry for this word, but fundamentally rotten the way we are dealing with this. Yeah, I saw this happening early. Like where, uh, there's an article uh, that I wrote, I don't know, five or six years ago on my website about how to start an inbound engagement. Now, this is when somebody actually fills out a form on your site. You're talking about they haven't even done anything, which it's it's cold sourcing. It's cold calling. And there's nothing wrong with that. I often relate it to, you know, are you the kind of person who's going to walk down the street, some, see somebody fall and twist or break their ankle and just keep walking by until they raise their hand and yell for help? Or you're going to say, hey, I saw that you fell down there. Would you like a hand up? That's cold calling to me. Like you didn't ask for my help, but I see that you might need it. And I'm seeing checking if you need it. And if you do, then I'm willing to help. I don't I think that we we're so quick to try to cram information down people's throats. Like we hear the fact that people are inundated with information. And so what do we do? We throw more information at them. Um, it's in the approach. It's in how you sell. There's nothing wrong with using intent data. It's how you're using it. And to your point, sending them something and then tracking it. It's like, I get those all of the time. I'm like, I, 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 and there's no way for me to unsubscribe because it's not a mass email, which is even more annoying to me. And more likely that I'm not going to want to have anything to do with your organization. It's spam. That's all it is. You're just adding to the noise, which is making it harder for anyone to hear you. Yeah. And, uh, and coming to the training, uh, the, the, the number of uh, senior sales leadership who are also good at training, that, that figure you said, 7 to 12, whatever the number is, percent, you know, it also correlates with the fact that the average time a vice president of sales is currently working in a large organization or in any organization for that matter is 18 months. Yeah, it's not that far off for CMOs either. Right. So, yeah. so imagine if, if you are if you know that I'm going to be in this job for like 18 months. What are you exactly going to do? I mean, you mm-hmm. will think, oh, I should create a team and I should really create an ace team and, and pour my knowledge into them so that so that they can do very well. And then I get kicked out after six, uh, 18 months. There are some yeah. very fundamental disconnects between what we are trying to achieve and what's going on. Right. Yeah. I think, so one of the things that I see happening, I work with a lot of VPs of sales and CROs, they get in and they're really keen on making sure that their first 90 days are gangbuster. Um, And the problem happens is that when they're interviewing for these roles, they're not asking questions. Again, we're going back to asking questions in the interview process. When you're the one being interviewed, is that it's really a sales conversation. They have a problem that you think that you can solve. And so now what you need to find out is what is the problem? What have they tried? These are questions to ask in your interview, sales leaders and executives. And then out of what they've tried, what worked, what hasn't worked? What about that do they think made it happen that way? Whose decision was it? How important is it to solve this problem? What's the impact and when? And here's the big question no one asks. What resources Are you willing to dedicate to solve this problem when I start on day one? Because what happens is is they have, they're sold on the idea, they're sold on the equity share, they're they're sold on, you know, making a name for themselves, but they're not thinking about the how and in the execution. Because what I see happen so often is that they have these great aspirational ideas, but no money or budget or resources to actually get it done. So they go into the role and they have to do everything, selling, managing, designing process, hiring people, and it's not anything any one human being can do and do well. That's why you have a life cycle of anywhere from 16 to 19 months for the average VP of sales, because they're not asking that question, what are you willing to dedicate, put into writing 
in this job offer that I will have his resources and team and budget to get these things done. So they're left handy. They're, 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 it's not that they're being set up to fail because what business owner wants to set their team up to fail? It's that they're not being set up to succeed. Very interesting. I, a side question to this is, do you think it has got something to do with our, you know, focus on this quarterly quota? So this here and now, so my, I'm a VP of sales interviewing for a job. My now is I need to get this job. I need to get in because I've lost the other job. So mm-hmm. I have to have a job because I have to put food on the table. And so I don't want to ask any question to which the, there may not be an answer. And thereby suddenly people will, oh, I can't hire this VP of sales because he needs stuff. He's not going to do everything and, and so on and so forth. And it sort of percolates down the to the SDR who is now told, you know what, your quota is 10% more than last quarter, where you didn't even achieve 50% of that quota. But now you're supposed to sell 100, you got 45. Mm-hmm. Now in this quarter, you have to do 110. Yep. Well, the problem is, is that if you don't ask the question, just like if your salesperson doesn't ask the question, the deal is never going to close and yes. you're going to have to be looking for a job again in 12 to 16 months. Yes. So yes, you could go ahead and take the job. And I've watched people do that. And when they're done at the end of it, they, they say, I really should have listened to what you said. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. I wasn't going to say I told you so, but I did tell you so. Mm-hmm. Um, it is just, it's, I mean, I've been in that position. I've been in the position where I was offered the job and I had to make the really hard decision. Do I ask the question and possibly get passed or do I just say what I think they need to hear in order for me to get the role so that I can get the job? Hmm. And I know, make, I know what it feels like to have to make that tough decision, but I can tell you, I've also made the decision in the other way. And I regretted the decision more when I didn't ask the question than when I did. I actually felt more confident after asking the question, knowing that I was, because it wasn't even a couple of weeks later that I found another opportunity. Right. I think it comes down to, I don't want to say your ethics because that's a heavy word, but it, yeah. it kind of comes down to who you are and what's important to you. And I think that you also have to realize that if you really truly want to succeed in the role, you have to ask those tough questions. Because if you can't have those tough conversations with your CEO now, you're not going to have them later when stuff isn't great. And that's when you need to be able to have those conversations. Absolutely. What is the solution? I mean, I know we we touched upon points, which, which touched upon what's wrong. So obviously some of it will flow out of that. But if if I say, uh, by, by the way, when you were talk, when we were talking about the doctor, I, I had this thought as you we were as you we were explaining. I thought, you know what? It's not even this doctor knows a lot of medicine. He knows only one medicine, and he's waiting for the for the patient to stop so that he can say, ah, you know, that's why that's why you should have this pill. Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, he has only one yeah, pill, right? right? <laughs> anyway, I, I'll just move away from there. What are the steps? I guess. Yeah, that I think, organized, yeah. yeah, so the, the steps to get to the solution for your organization, because there's no one fits all solution. And I'm not going to tell you, oh, my program is the perfect one for everybody because it's not perfect for everybody. But I think that what you need to think of as a sales leader is how do I take the bias and opinion and guesswork out of my sales, my sales operation, my sales strategy and my sales team? And we're using the metaphor of the doctor. So let's think about this for a minute. If you think back to the 19th century when medicine was, you know, a religion, they were seen as barbarians. They were seen as, you know, people who just blindly followed the teachings of a few based on myth or whatever. And it wasn't based on the scientific process. It wasn't until the Renaissance started and they started to introduce the scientific process into medicine through dissection and experimentation that they actually started to gain the respectability that we take for granted today. If you look at the medical profession then to where the sales profession is now, I think that the answer is the same. We need to use objectivity. We need to use data. We need to use science to design who we hire, how we train them, how we create the solutions for the people that we're trying to help. And it's not impossible. There is data out there. There is science that tells us how people buy and make decisions and change behaviors. 
And it does still come down to mindsets and beliefs, but those mindsets and beliefs become behaviors that then become our results. And when we can understand, like you don't have to be a scientist or a PhD to understand those types of concepts. And so when you look at your hiring process, if you look at all of these types of things and you look at where am I basing this decision on the opinions of a few and my own subjective experiences, and where can I start to reduce that? So, you know, for example, we use ob objective data in the hiring process that 2 million sales professionals who've been evaluated on 282 attributes over 30 years across the globe in all industries. I'm going to rely on that data versus the, you know, 100 or so companies that I've worked with or that someone else has worked with. There's just more predictability there, right? But then I'm also looking at how can we design our hiring programs and our training and coaching programs for leadership, managers, and sellers where we're taking into account the biases that we have and how we learn and how we make decisions and change behaviors versus the latest fad, the latest methodology. Let's base it on the actuality of what happens in our human brains when we need to learn. And there are ways that we can do that. That's how we design our programs at Unbound Growth. But I think that any organization can take a look at where do we have our biggest fall offs, whether that's, you know, the conversion rates that you're having in your marketing. How are, are we really speaking about buyers? Are we talking to buyers or are we talking about how wonderful we are? Like, here's a quick test. Go look at all your marketing and sales copy and count every word where you say I, me, we or our and then compare that to every word that then talks about your buyer, you, yours. And then compare them. Is the wee-wee factor all the way up here and the buyer factor all the way down here? That's the quick way to see, are we talking about the buyer's problems or what we do? There's one place. Um, you can look at your hiring process. How, how are we building our ideal customer profile? Is it based off of what we think are, are, subject, are success things? Like I talk to leaders and they say, well, I need someone who's curious and detail-oriented. And I'm like, great. Have you ever seen a salesperson who is detail oriented and curious fail? If the answer is yes, then that is not predictable objective data that you're going to be able to use to hire your next person because interviews are subjective. So how do we reduce that subjectivity? Use a pre-screening and assessment so that you're only interviewing people who have the right attributes to be successful in the role. And then how we're coaching and training. Most managers are not training every other day or even once a week. It's maybe once every other week, maybe once a month. And their idea of coaching, because that's what happened with them when they were sellers, is you do a pipeline review, you ask about every deal, what's going to happen next and where the gaps are into them, that's coaching. It's not coaching. It's a pipeline review. It's an accountability meeting. So we need to change the way that we think about coaching and training so that it's not a, we're going to cram this information down your throat. You're going to forget half of it in a week. And then we're going to expect you to change everything about the way that you sell after this training program. It's just not going to happen. So those are just a couple of areas where I see the biggest opportunities for data and science to make an impact in the performance and the conversion rates that we're seeing in B2B sales. And I'll say one last thing. I hear this a lot too, is, well, what should my conversion rate be? What's the industry average? What's my competitor's conversion rate? Again, it's apples and oranges because it's not your buyer, it's not your market, it's not your company, and it's not your offering. So look at whatever your conversion rate is now, and then look at where your goals are and what does that conversion rate need to improve on in order for you to get there? What's the gap? And then once you've identified what the gap is, what am I willing to invest to bridge that gap, what is it worth to me? And then what does that look like? I, it, we tend to have this reaction to what we see in our numbers. Meetings are down, activities are down, conversion rates are down. And so we start throwing things at it from our offices because we're worried about six to 12 months down the road of what's gonna happen if those things continue. And you should be worried, but the reaction that most leaders have is to throw some immediate action on it. Like I've talked with owners who said, my salespeople aren't doing anything. They're not doing anything. There's nothing happening because there's no sales coming in yet. And so then they they blast off with, okay, we're going to do this now. We're going to do that now. We're going to do this now. And they're creating the chaos that their sellers can't seem to get through to actually make some headway and improvement. So we need to also, as leaders, think about what's our attitude towards sales? How do we react when things are not going so well? And how do we need to change that? Because that's going to have a huge impact as it it does. It's a trickle down effect to your your leaders, your managers, your sellers, all the way to your BDRs. And 
face first into your customer. I want to touch upon something you, you, you touched upon right at the beginning. The fact that the buyer we are selling to is a different buyer. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they, are, they are not the same that we were selling to 20 years back. Uh, the sales folks are not controlling the process anymore. And the buyer is, I mean, despite They're the overlook. Right. They're not even trying to control the sales process. They're not even trying to influence it. They're, I, I, I'm going to just throw out like 90 odd percent of the sellers that I see and work with. Sorry about that. They are reacting to something that's happened. Like you were talking about the intent data. They're reacting to that. It's great to be able to find people that might be having a problem that you can solve, but they're just reacting to it. They're not creating opportunities in conversations. Right. So, I mean, I, I let the intent data go in for the time being because uh, it's also the end. The intent data is something which is going to happen today, but that was in the making like 12 months back, right? So. Right. The closer, the same intent data is being sold to five of your competitors as well. Nobody is selling exclusive intent data. So which means you are at the same time talking to this, this prospect who is also being approached by five other competitors. So, so intent data has its value, but it's only so much and no more. Uh, having yeah. said that, the fact, I mean, I think there is a need to acknowledge that the buyer is, imp- like you said, because of the internet, like so many things have changed the buyer is really in control of the buying process, which essentially, like like we say, that making selling easy will not have a sale. Making buying easy will have a sale, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You need to make buying easy uh, for, for people and whatever that means. Um, so how do you see the, the buyer today compared to the buyers, say, two decades back? So... I hate to age myself because the two decades back was when, you know, I started my career, right? So it's the difference that I see, the biggest difference that I see is that we we think that buyers are more informed and more educated. But what the the reality I think is that I'll give you an example. My husband and I are trying to buy a vehicle right now. We don't want to go to a dealership because of COVID. Uh, there's tons of information that are available that's available on the internet. Um, but you know, my husband started doing these searches, right? And he found, all right, these are the this is the most recommended truck of what we're looking for. So he went, he called the local dealership. He said, hey, I'm looking for this truck. The dealership said, okay, great, we have a truck like that here. Let's send it up to your house. Now the problem is, is that the 2016 Toyota Tundra with the 4.83 V6 or V8 engine has timing change problems. We never would have known that it had timing chain problems because it didn't say that on the internet. The salesperson didn't tell us, but our buddy who lives across the street says, hey, I happen to look into that vehicle and I know. And so when we went and Google and searched for that specific thing, we found that information. But the salesperson never mentioned it to us. We don't trust him anymore. And now we're going to another dealership. So this is how the buyer has changed because before two decades ago, we wouldn't have been able to find that information on the internet. And not only that, we would have had to rely on what the salesperson said to us as being the truth. We don't have to rely on what the salesperson said to us as being the truth anymore. And I would say to salespeople out there that when you're listening to this is that if you can't add more value to the conversation than Google does, then you're not being consultative, you're not collaborating with your buyer, and you're not going to get the sale. I think that's a great point to end, but by no means this ends our discussion. I think we should continue to chat about this, and I, I, I really want to stay focused on this, this, this space because I think it's so vital that we yeah. need to talk about it. I mean, we don't even talk about it. So I think we need to do a lot of talking to sort of bring the balance back, you know, <laughs> the cosmic balance of conversion failure versus conversion success. So yeah, uh, we're great at talking about the wonderful things that we do in sales, but it's in the failings that we learn the most. And I think as leaders, especially as sales leaders, if we can share our failings, that also then makes it easier for our team to share theirs. And then we get a clear idea of what is happening in our sales organizations and what's not working. But the fear of getting fired or demoted or seen as less than in sales organizations is what doesn't cause our sellers to say, I'm struggling here. And so they continue to struggle and we don't know why and we don't know how to fix it. And then 
They either get fired, they leave a bad glass door review, and then the cycle continues and continues and continues. Absolutely. Carol, thank you so much for, for joining me this morning. I, I really appreciate your taking the time and the trouble uh, and such a, uh, such a wonderful discussion we had. Absolutely. It's a, a, a passionate topic of mine, um, one that I've been focused on for a long time. So I'm glad that there is another voice who is as passionate about it as I am. Thank you.